Hey everybody, and you are listening to the Soberful Podcast, and I am joined today by Dr. Ben Walden. Hi, Ben. Hello, hello. And Ben's all the way over in uh, East Anglia, which is the part of England that I'm from. Are you Suffolk or Norfolk? No, I'm Norfolk, yeah, very Norfolk. Norfolk, very Norfolk, <laughs> very Norfolk. <laughs> Um, so Ben's joining me because, uh, very kindly, I wanted to do something around neurodiversity and particularly aut autism, and it's not my area of specialism. And I wanted to get somebody who had just greater experience than I did to just, so we can just have a conversation about it. And it was prompted by a question that somebody, and this was a while ago, so hopefully they hung in there until this episode came. But I'm going to read what this listener sent in. Would it be possible to talk about autism and alcohol and sobriety? I understand you may not have much knowledge on the subject, but honestly, just something small on it could be a lifeline for people. I had quite the sobriety journey and felt that AA was difficult to relate in and stop going. I continued being sober, but was unhappy after 18 months, did a lot of diagnostic tests and realized I was autistic. It had been joked about in my family before, but I never took it seriously until the dulling effects of alcohol were taken away and I had to face social situations without it. I honestly felt like I was going mad before my diagnosis and I haven't been, see, I haven't seen or heard anything about alcohol and autism and it would really be a massive help to me at the start of my journey. So that's kind of what prompted me to uh, want to do this episode. So mm -hmm. before we get started, tell us a little bit about you and what you do. Yeah, so I'm I'm an, an addictions consultant. Uh, I trained as a, a general adult psychiatrist, and I've done work a, across the board, really, uh, from sort of old age psychiatry to, to sort of working within a, a child and adolescent team. But my main interest, I think, pretty much from the end of my university days, has always been working in addictions. I was lucky enough to be able to, to follow that through uh, over the course of my training, and then and then lucky further to be able to to get to work in it for the last sort of decade or so as a as a consultant with with a, with a couple of little other bits of 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 work in in uh in between um in a couple of spare mm. years here and there but yeah i've been as i say I've, I've been working as a as a consultant psychiatrist now since uh 2013 and and as i say addiction's always been where i've been interested in and and general adult psychiatry gives me has given me plenty of exposure to all, all sorts of problems, including, mm. as you say, the wow. sort of issues with neurodiversity and, and so forth. And it's certainly something I think I've seen in my clinical practice within addictions. Wow. Okay. So first of all, can you, what is autism? Can we start there? So that's, if anything, becoming a more complicated question as, as time goes on, I think. But mm. in, my, in my line of work, the, the definition, as it were, still remains around the deficits or, or potential problems that people may have if they suffer from autism. So how it's clinically defined um, and how you'd end up with a diagnosis is through having essentially problems with your communication in social situations typically in particular the ability to to sort of reciprocate social interaction can be very difficult or to, to find it difficult to understand all of the communication that that happens when we're communicating socially with each other a lot of changes in the way you might phrase things or different body language can seem difficult to to get hold of and understand for for somebody with autism um they it's also defined by potential problems in communicating back so you get you get that sort of double whammy of having difficulty understanding what somebody may be saying to you but also difficulty in communicating back in the way that the, the neurotypical i guess would expect and whether as a result of that or as part of other processes that then can cause difficulty in social interaction social relationships uh difficulty in you know sort of typical environments such as, as work and, and in, in social situations but to be fair the clinical diagnosis of autism and what autism is I think are moving if anything further apart and I for one I'm 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 quite supportive of of mm. the idea of neurodiversity I I quite like that you know ultimately we're all unique everybody everybody is different from every other person and actually there are I've just named a bunch of 
potential problems that people with autism can have, but it is also recognised that there are potential strengths, there are potential sort of different ways of thinking which can be very useful in certain situations. And as such, that sort of, I, I, I readily acknowledge, you know, both to you and, and your listeners that, that that clinical definition, while it remains the clinical definition, is is not really the whole story about what autism is mm. but yeah it's 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 a difficult thing because it's a, it's a it's a full conversation and actually i think it's better that it's a full conversation these days than j- just listening to the medical types like me saying oh well your problem is this that and the other so you're saying you know as as a psychiatrist we we're, we're all constantly learning more we're constantly there's more research and that's you know how we look at this and how we diagnose it and how we treat it means that you know it it's evolving basically yes yes i think i think that's fair to say i i think you know we've we've all we've all probably got that relative or friend somewhere that talks about oh well it didn't really exist in my day did it yeah and i i think the reality is like most things it probably did exist and we didn't see it as much you know the the the, the history yeah. of the, the history of these sorts of problems is is unfortunately a bit bleak and you know we used to we used to put people in in asylums and those sorts of places back in the day so there's autism i mean there's there's the the severe end where people are nonverbal right mm-hmm. and and not a, not able to function which is a whole different thing mm-hmm. what we're really talking about is people who can function mm-hmm but there's big things like not being able to like read the room is kind of what you're describing, isn't it? They can't pick up on social clues. They can't read the room. They can't because so much communication is nonverbal, right? It's mm-hmm. not the words that we say is not is lots of other things that carry weight. I mean, so we could like, you know, if someone if a couple were having a furious row and we walked into the room 30 seconds later, you can you can feel it, can't you? You can be like, yes. oh, what, what's going on here? So yeah. it's not being able to do any of that. I, I can't imagine what that must be. It must like, it, I feel like it's going on the London Underground without a map. You just get on trains and hope you end up where you want to, but you could be north when you're meant to be south. It must feel like that it must be really hard. I myself, I, I can only imagine as well. And, and I think that's that's probably a, a decent analogy. It's it's. It's yeah, it's it's trying to navigate something that that every and I guess that's where the tube really fits in is everybody around you seems to be able to just instinctively know what to do. Yeah. So they they walk on, they walk off. It, it seems like nothing. As as somebody that's unfamiliar with it and doesn't know where they're going, it, the whole thing is is complex, and you're getting lots of different information all at once. One of the one of the talents of people with with autism is is an ability to focus very keenly on things at times the reciprocal of that is it can be difficult when you're presented with a lot of pieces of information at once in particular social situations Mm. do exactly that you know you've got lots of people lots of conversation lots of lots of different things to potentially focus on and I think where it where it then starts to coincide with with addiction certainly actually a very human experience I don't think one that is separate whether you have autism or adhd or psychosis or whatever it is it's anxiety and actually we know that that so much so much of addiction can be fueled by anxiety in itself and Mm. feeling out of place in your current situation no we know that we know that a lot of drug and alcohol use is for exactly that it's it's to feel okay in those situations where we don't and for me certainly the idea of of exact of of being that being the social situation i find it find it almost almost a normal thing in 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 my understanding that somebody somebody with difficulties like that would end up considering using drugs or alcohol to be honest it's it's a very difficult one yeah i mean that's what anxiety fueled my alcohol problem um and and it was just lack of confidence and lack mm-hmm. of self-esteem when I was a teenager and alcohol worked like I was you know that this was in the late 80s early 90s alcohol worked and then I had a really bad experience with drugs and I got um really bad panic attacks and anxiety and alcohol mm-hmm. worked with that in terms of it didn't work but it took away like it that first hour it just took the edge off and yeah. like it made everything worse it made it so I, I it made it better for yeah. a moment right 
Yeah, it works yep. in the moment. And, and yep. when you have anxiety, all you care about is the moment. Yes, exactly. Like you don't like tom- tomorrow doesn't what like all you care about is feeling better in that moment. And and you'd have done it, it, anything. And so I wonder then if a lot of autistic people are using alcohol because they find social situations so difficult to navigate that it quickly becomes a crutch is that what you think is happening a lot i think uh, what's interesting is that there's there's been a change in the narrative in terms of whether people with autism are more, are more or less likely to have addiction problems in the first place in the last maybe sort of decade 15 years or so um, it used to be believed that people people were less likely to have addiction problems and, and the sort of speculation around that was people with autism often will grow up feeling slightly awkward in social situations won't go into them as much and they are the triggers for using yeah. drugs and alcohol um more more recent studies that i'm familiar with have have suggested that perhaps it's not the case and and rates are if if not huge compared to some other conditions they're probably similar to the general public or even slightly higher than the general public and as i say for me it's logical i often talk about drugs and alcohol not not being this sort of big scary monster that we're all told about when we're children they they're a logical choice a lot of the time that people make because it makes them feel better yeah it's you know in all reality as we know if that was the end of the story there wouldn't be any problem here but we we know that's not how addiction pans out yeah but certainly i think again i i think for for so many people i meet of of all of all flavors and varieties anxiety is such a common issue that either predates or goes hand in hand with their addiction that to me it would make it would make perfect sense that somebody with an autistic spectrum disorder is doing exactly that as you say they're 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 doing something to try and quell that anxiety in the moment because as you say i mean that's prehistorically that's exactly what anxiety is for is is to get us to deal with something right now run away from the saber-toothed tiger run away from the the pouring jets of lava or whatever it is that's that's why we've got these systems in our body and yeah and so as you say dealing with it in the moment is the be all and end all when you're feeling like that so treating someone somebody who's uh alcohol problem or drug problem has then become problematic and they've recognized it and they want to get help it requires such a different approach how do we help people who who uh i mean this this question this lady and i'm assuming it was a lady you know so much part like i've i've been working in treatment programs for 20 years and a massive part i mean key part of it is connection and community and Absolutely. it's so important, you know, we all need it, but that's such a big obstacle for someone and they probably don't know why. And it must be so scary because they don't have their security blanket. Absolutely. One of one of the first principles of trying to try to manage any anything really where, where you've got two problems at once is, is to recognize how one will impact the other. One of the mm. things that I know certainly in, in this country where I work, uh, it's not just that group work is is everywhere within in treatment programs. It, it's often the, the only thing. And that can be incredibly yeah. intimidating for somebody yeah with autistic spectrum disorder and you do and i you know i've met people i've read case histories i've read read accounts of people describing exactly that where they they go in to a treatment service or they go into aa or you know they can they can see the machinery they can see what is trying to be achieved but but it, they can't access it because because yeah because it's not it's not for them it's for people who are able to sit down comfortably with a group of strangers yeah you know we've all got that little bit of anxiety but but we're not talking a bit of butterflies we're not talking a bit of stage fright here we you know we're talking crippling need to flee need to leave the room immediately yeah yeah and we'll keep you in your house next time you think about going sort of anxiety so i have zero doubt that it can be very difficult approaching treatments for anybody, let alone somebody with a, an autistic. I think it is always important to remember that most services, wherever you approach them, have an ethos of wanting to help you in one way, shape or form. Um, and, mm. and I think 
because there's often such a barrier in approaching services in the first place. There's the, the you know, the shame, the first steps, the, the, the admitting a problem, all of that, all of yeah, that stuff that yeah. can get in the way. Yeah. Um, it can lead to that, that those first meetings, they can be quite formulaic. They can be, you know, you, you don't know how much to give of yourself. You don't know who the person you're talking to is all that sort of difficulty in it. And that, that all just gets magnified. Therefore, the best best sort of early approach is to recognize things as quickly as possible um to to not be to not be ashamed to not be expecting anybody that you meet to be able to spot it in you or anything like Mm. that you know it's worth remembering a lot of Mm. addiction workers have some history of working with people with other problems a lot don't and yeah. so it's what I what I am confident of is that I, I see very few places where people don't want to try and help. So even if even if they might not have something that's right for you right now, get somebody interested and, and that situation can change. In terms of practicalities, certainly it is, it is often a good idea to try more of a one to one approach initially. You're, you're absolutely right that that connection and and uh, you know I'm a mm. big believer in the worth of group work specifically for people who find groups difficult because finding a group difficult is a thing when when you're finding a group yeah. less difficult you've got some of the skills that are also going to help you elsewhere but yeah. definitely starting off with a bit more one-to-one work and linking in with anybody that's already available you know if you've already got a, another service or another treatment team working with you with your autism then absolutely do not be afraid do not be worried about saying that to them that you're you're having this problem with with addiction yeah because you want their involvement as soon as possible you want as many people on your side because the actually people will want to try and will want to try and help it and make it work for you still i remain confident of that most places yeah, I go. no i i yeah, I, I agree with you. So the first kind of the big takeaway I, I'm getting here is if you find groups and social situations incredibly stressful and anxiety provoking, there may be other reasons for that. Not just because like I remember when I ran group therapy when I was running a rehab, like everybody finds group therapy, first of all, intimidating, scary and whatever. And mostly people settle down really easily and, and it's mm-hmm. fine. Same with AA meetings and stuff. Like nobody mm-hmm. goes to their first AA meeting skipping, going, hey, you know, everyone <laughs> slinks in and sits at the back and feels terrified. So everybody goes through that at the beginning, I think, more or less. And then if you kind of, like I settled down and it was fine. If If you find that you don't after that initial kind of hump, then... There could be something else going on and that's not your fault. And Mm -hmm. it's really worth exploring and finding out what that is. Because I think certainly from what this person who wrote in is, I think it's the knowledge is power. Once you, once you know this about you, like I'm dyslexic, right? And, and for years I thought I was stupid and I knew Mm -hmm. I wasn't, but I couldn't understand why I couldn't spell anything, but I knew what, so, and I'd feel embarrassed and ashamed. Once I got that diagnosis, which I didn't get to those at university, it was like transformational for me. It's like, oh, like I have this and now I have tools to navigate around this. Is it a bit like that? Do you think? That idea of tools to navigate around this, that couldn't be more accurate. Look, the, the reality is that sometimes, sometimes it, it can be quite a, quite, quite a miserable place being a doctor because you're sitting there telling people bad things um you know you're you're mm. telling them about things that are going to be difficulties in their life going forward and and I have certainly you know I've I've in the past I've I've worked with I've worked with people I've worked with parents of of children where we think you know mm. we think this diagnosis is 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 getting fairly clear and you often have a moment of am I am I actually doing am I actually doing this person any favors here because mm. The, the next question they're going to ask me is, okay, what do we do about it? You know, what do we, are we going to stop this being a problem? And I've, I've, I've not got a great deal of answers then in all reality, mm. because it, it is, it is. And, and as I say, this is, it's one of the reasons actually I really like, I really like the idea of neurodiversity and recognizing that this is a different person, not a yeah. different monster, not, not a different disease, not, not a different cookie cutter people. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. You know, I'm good at talking at length and, and, and rattling on some people are good at making their point really quickly other people can jump high etc etc yeah yeah and so i think 
I, I, I focusing on on what what your experiences are. And as you say, you know, if these things aren't working, if you do have this sense in your background, because in all reality, most people with these conditions have a sense of something being wrong long before they get a diagnosis. Or have a sense, again, I've used the word wrong there, I've fallen into my own bad habits, but a sense of something being different. I've heard a million and one patients, clients, whichever word you wish to your service users, I think in, in my life, neck of the woods is, is popular, but I've, I've heard a million and one people tell me, I know my own body, I know my own mind, mm. I know what's right yeah. and what's wrong, and this isn't right. Yeah. And I've always encouraged people, don't let people dissuade you from that instinct. It is a reasonable yeah, instinct. Yeah. Don't not listen to advice and expertise, of course. But but actually, if if it, if there is something that feels different, um, and in particular, you know, if if you've if you've always grown up, you know, and and you've you've ended up in an issue with addiction because you felt that you've never quite you've never quite been like other people, you've never quite fitted in, or all all that sort of thing, then then yes, there there is a question to ask. And again, that. That cynicism about well I I can't I can't make, take this away for you so is it really that good that you know about it? I have every confidence that that's that's my own biases talking because I I don't think I've met anyone really in my career who has not benefited from actually knowing a bit more about what's going on with them. Yeah. Even when yeah. you can't do anything, or even when. Yeah. I've had, you know, I've certainly I've had clients before who I've diagnosed with with problems in their sort of 30s, 40s that in all reality have been problems their whole life. And they've come to me at the mm. end of it and said, OK, fine. Thank you very much. I've, I've you know, I, mm. I know what this is now. I don't want to do anything about it because, as you mm. said, I've got my own tools now. You know, I've, I've got to a point in my life where I know what to do. I've got my way of dealing with this and I don't I don't necessarily need anybody yeah. to give me a bunch more of them there is yeah. nothing wrong with that whatsoever there is i'd say there is there is help there's lots of charities all over Bova that, mm. that can support and they're often the best places to go to in the in the first instance because they'll provide mm. advocacy they'll provide people that can can support you in in you know sort of applications and filling stuff in and, and all the all the kind of things that you often do when you're joining new services i i find it quite a rewarding thing to do um, I mean, addiction, mm. addictions work is, as you know, it's, it's, it's pretty mm. much some of the most rewarding work you can get when it goes mm. well. And, mm. uh, and the reality is that I, I do find that anywhere where I'm able to, I'm able to speak to something and, and speak to somebody where it feels like I'm, I'm helping them understand their way through the world can feel very good because I, I can see people benefiting from it. And, and, and again, going out and a bit tried to say, but just believing in themselves a little bit more. Like you say with the dyslexia, like not just saying, I'm, I'm stupid. There's your problem. I'm stupid. I'm yeah, a weirdo. Yeah. yeah. We're, all, we're all stupid sometimes. We're all weird sometimes. All of those things happen. We all, we're all different. We're all different and unique. And I think what you're saying as well is older, I think a lot of old pe older people have found workarounds, haven't they? They've just, I'm thinking that years ago, what we used to do, because I have a, a, an older family member who I believe is autistic and he's never going to get diagnosed. Um, and and for years we we treated her like she was um, uh, odd or difficult. Mm -hmm. And now I look back and I'm like, it's so clearly autism. It's so clear. Mm -hmm. And and it, so this is kind of one of the points I wanted to make is that helped helped me make sense of a lot of things. And it also made me feel so much more gentler and supportive towards them when I'm like oh, that. That's what it is. I mean, it was anyway. Um, and so I'm thinking in the recovery community of which I'm part of. Like I, I just, you know, I'm, I'm part of a local recovery community. If I knew that about someone or they could communicate it to me, I would want to help. Like, I'd want to be like, how, okay, how can I make this experience more comfortable for you? Like what, what would, you know, what would support you? You want, you want to come, but like I, and I feel like as, in general, the recovery community would absolutely. So it's really, it's about kind of communicating this and understanding it a bit more i mean we're so, it, it's so different I, I mean my my grandson is um on the spectrum and we now we know this like again 30 40 years ago we didn't but there's so mm -hmm. many like there's so many accommodations for autistic people now that and and it's just it's got to be better i think 
because now I'm thinking about it, there's a lot of accommodations, particularly for autistic kids. Like, you know, they do like uh, live theatre. They'll do a, a performance just for autistic kids because they know they're kind of going to be a bit disruptive or whatever. And and mm-hmm. so they do that so they can experience the theatre or cinema or whatever it is. And um, now I'm thinking it, it's like, it's almost like the recovery community. It's like, we need to kind of have a look at this and be like, where can we be a bit more co- more accommodating for our autistic friends one of the one of the one of the key principles always is to remember that there is there there are as many there are as many recovery journeys as there are recoveries right they, they, this is the thing yeah we all need something a bit different to our neighbor and i think i think you're right i can absolutely i, I can speak with i can speak with with some honesty that that it 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 isn't something that's brilliantly provided across the board uh, where where I work. It tends to be something where there's people who are particularly interested, and I think that's the key. It's about you know if, if this is something that matters to you and you are you are working in a recovery community, then be that person, be the person that's interested, be the be the champion. You know, go out look for it, look for the information about it, because there's no doubt that the people are there. You know, they're if 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 you're if you're working in a, in any reasonable sized service with any reasonable amount of 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 people then somebody there is going to be on the autistic spectrum somewhere mm. and and as such as as you say i i think the reality is that we're not we're not we're not talking about sort of wheelchair ramps and accessible lifts and that sort of thing it is a more yeah. difficult thing to un to to be tangible because some of it yeah. isn't visible yeah. but yeah but wherever yeah. you can you know like you say just just make something more straightforward make a piece of information more easy to digest yeah. or, or at least just you know putting it more clearly yeah. so that there isn't there isn't sort of room for difficulties and and again I, you know i i know i've I've gone wrong myself when I've when I've not known about it in the past and I've ended up in a sort of fierce debate about something because because I've got I've allowed myself to kind of get a bit sidetracked in in what I'm doing and and then I've thought well you know I've reflected back and thought hang on a minute if I'd have if I'd have been thinking okay where's my client coming from here I'd have been able to work that around a bit differently you know I'd, I'd have been able to talk about mm. more things mm. besides that because I'd, I'd have recognized that this is this is clearly the focus for you i wonder how i wonder how many other things are currently a problem for it for example mm. something like that mm. and i don't as i say i don't think we need i don't th- i don't think the world needs new buildings and big flags and all the rest of it and i don't i don't think our, our autistic friends would would welcome that necessarily mm. i don't want to walk around with a flag on my on my back mm. and I'm, I'm sure i'm sure others don't uh but but yeah on on that side of it, being able to be curious, to be to be interested, and to say, okay, in particular, what can I do to help you? Yeah, it's as simple as that. Sometimes yeah. it's as simple as that. One, one last question: in terms of prescribing, mm-hmm. is is that because you you prescribe, right? Is mm-hmm. that an option? Is that a pathway for people who are autistic and trying to get sober? Like, how would how would that work? And is there options? The the simple answer is absolutely. It isn't something right. that should be should be considered as not an option or, or or ruled out right right i'm i'm not aware of any major sort of complications in it there are a couple of you know there's a couple of little bits naltrexone for example you know used to used in a lot of places in in a lot of different ways naltrexone can exacerbate psychotic thoughts for example and people with autism are statistically slightly more likely to have them so you may wish to just follow up that little bit more carefully if you were the prescriber for example that said as i say it would absolutely not be a barrier for me and i'm sure for for many many of my colleagues right um it, right. There, there shouldn't be there shouldn't be things that get in the way i think what perhaps is important to remember is the, is the opposite way which is that prescribing is never never a cure-all and i certainly again have had the experience before of of feeling that i'm, I'm working with somebody for whom that that's the issue that the focus has become on well the medication will fix me and yeah trying to sort of move away from that but but yeah in in terms of prescribing i don't i don't think there's any there's any significant barriers at all at most a little yeah. bit more careful monitoring 
Thank you for saying that. Yeah, thank you for so much for saying that because it's I'm I'm always I'm as a, a therapist I'm very open to uh, medical pathways of recovery, uh, but I am very very clear that it is it is part of the tapestry. It is a pill's not going to fix it. Absolutely. You, there's uh, a cognitive and emotional work and all that kind of stuff. Ben, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much. I've really, I've had some real takeaways and it, it, I'm going to think about what can we do as a recovery community to be more accessible and supportive of people who are, who are on the spectrum. I guess the last thing I just want to say is going back to the original question. So there are some people, there's, there's people as they're getting sober, they're like, what, what? Mm -hmm. So you, you would go to a psychologist or psychiatrist to get that diagnosis. I get, I guess we would encourage them to seek help with them, with a, with, with an appropriate professional to maybe explore a diagnosis or, or rule it out. Yes. I, again, I, I can't speak for, can't speak for everywhere, but you, you would be unlikely to, you know, I'm a, I'm a consultant psychiatrist, but you'd be unlikely to be diagnosed formally with this in my addiction service. Not least of all because because we, we haven't necessarily got the, the sort of specialist environment to be able to then do anything about it. And we've got a mental health team over there that potentially can. So yes, it, it would normally be the case that you'd you'd approach typically as I say, a, a, some kind of, of clinical assessment service in this country. Sometimes they're provided within the NHS. Sometimes they're provided by yeah. sort of other providers. Mm. And 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 certainly assessment, as always, is always quite a yeah. quite an intimidating thing in itself. But it's the the process through which you end up with hopefully yeah. a better understanding of where you can go next and what to do. Yeah. I know it's no, it's easy for me to say from the other side of the couch, as it were. But those yeah. spheres are always something where, if if you can get yourself through them, the other side is normally a brighter yeah. place. But yeah, yeah it, it, you'd I think you'd be lucky to have met somebody with the skills and ability within an addiction service to do it. But you certainly, it may well be that somebody there would pick up on something. Um, as say, a lot of us have experience mm. in in other other parts of. Mm other parts of dealing yeah. with mental health because again as we know ad addiction yeah. addiction and trauma addiction and suffering they, these things go hand in hand mm. so yeah just again if, if yeah. you do find somebody good yeah. take their name yeah. take the name and keep hold of it yeah brilliant Bren. thank you so much um i really appreciate you coming on and sharing your expertise I i've learned a lot and i think this will be helpful I, th I think that there's just more to know and there's more to research yeah. and there's more to communicate and there's more to understand. And we're still, there's still a lot of unknowns here, but yeah. I've certainly, I know you've helped me uh, think about quite a few things and hopefully uh, to all our listeners as well. So thank you so much for coming on. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much for having me. Um, it's been a pleasure. You're welcome.